So this is beautiful with Koi Mekong, and the reason that we're here is because our director, Jennifer Podemski, this is where she came to her very first powwow. The Anishinaabe have always gathered to celebrate life with song and dance. The government of Canada enacted policies of assimilation, forcing an end to such celebrations. In 1960, Rosemary Fisher led a group of community members to revitalize this silence tradition. It's interesting to me because so many people, I think, really believe that powwows are a ceremony. Powwows came out of us not being able to be who we are. If there are young people who think that powwow is all there is to ceremony, then they're gonna miss out on not only who they are, but their true origin stories, and they'll miss out on all of the beautiful meaning behind those dances. For someone like me who's never been there, and I, and I see an opportunity to go and, and powwow, should I not take advantage of that and try and learn, learn that for myself? Listen, Chris, the truth is, is that I didn't feel like I was part of my people until I built myself a powwow outfit and started engaging in that way. It's a start. Yeah. Well, let's see what we got here. That's it. Cool. Wiki. Wiki. <laughs> My name is Chris Nargang. I am an archaeologist and artist. My grandmother was a residential school survivor who hid her true identity from our family. I am on this journey to find my truth, reconcile the past, and continue the legacy that was stolen from her. Way. I'm Anishinaabe from Batuana First Nation, and I belong to the Three Fires Medewin Medicine Society. The movement of Indigenous knowledge revitalization is thriving across Turtle Island, and I want to introduce Chris and all of you to the revolutionary work being done by those who have dedicated their lives to shifting colonial narratives by harnessing Indigenous knowledge. Way, 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 we are, we are the, the future, future our ancestors, ancestors dreamed of. Our prophecies tell us that the time is now to reclaim, rematriate, and revitalize the knowledge intended for us. This, this is Future, future History. history. So you consider a, a traditional gathering a gathering and a powwow is not a gathering? Um, so the powwow I see as a celebration, a gathering to celebrate what's going on in the physical world, where I see ceremony as a responsibility. I could probably go without a powwow, yeah, yeah. but I cannot go can't without, go without ceremony. ceremony. Yeah. So Chris, if you were going to go to a powwow and dance for the first time, what what uh, style would you choose? I would probably go traditional as men, and I'd probably be the best looking guy out there with my art abilities. <laughs> I'd just, I'd get the best regalia I could ever make myself. <laughs> Here we are in beautiful Sarnia in Southern Ontario, and we're about to meet. We're gonna meet Jordan Williams White Eye. So he was literally like the championship Palo dancer back in the day. Bonjour, I postay Gabawa Nini, the Nizna Kaz, Bikedrano and the Dunjaba, Meshkin Dodam, and Ishnabe and Dao. My spirit name is uh, the one that brings light to the darkness. I'm from Bikedrano territory, formerly, formerly known as Wapo Island. The powwow is a celebration of life. When our tribes went to war, they would come home, come back to the camp, and they would have a celebration of life for those ones that never made it back. And at that time, there, there would be gifts put in, into the middle. Um, it would be flint, pelts, stuff like that. Stuff really useful around the camp. And the dancers would dance, and at that time they handed them out as gifts. Later on, they would actually start to compete for those gifts. You know, power was a way to make money. People today can, can pack up a suitcase with their outfit and their clothes and they can journey, go power wherever they want. 
there ain't too many cultures or, you know, that, that can do that. We had so much poverty of uh, lateral violence, alcoholism, addictions. Now, because of what we were going through, the celebration of life was one of the things that we could truly call ours where we can come and see happiness. Being an intergenerational residential school survivor, I know that uh, they carried that shame. And one way to get rid of that shame was to connect with that sacred circle, to connect with that music, to connect with that, that dance, to move forward you know, culturally, traditionally, spiritually, so they can see their great-great-grandchildren prosper and, and live a good life and not have to go what they went through. It's a celebration, you know, it, it, it's not a ceremony. You can't take it too serious because it is a celebration. And uh, when we take it too, too serious, then we become people who scold. And sometimes people are chased away and they never return. And that's sad. We are a healing nation. We are lucky to have this way of life. And if you come and watch us dance, hear the songs, you will understand what unconditional love is. You will understand the original instructions of the Creator for us as a First Nation. That's who we are. So Monique Mojica is definitely one of the most um, sought after and renowned actresses and performers, creators within the indigenous community. And she also comes from an incredible family. Like the legacy of her family and the work that they have done within indigenous theater is unprecedented. And her experience of growing up in contact with these exhibitions, with these Wild West shows and with her family, um, you know, taking part in that, I think is probably a big inspiration for her work. She's a good girl that is it. Izzy keeps her apron clean. I serve high tea in the nut house. Izzy keeps her apron clean. Thank you. Oh, Jamie Witch. Jamie Witch. Who is Izzy? Yes. Izzy's a character based loosely on my great-grandmother. She grew up on the banks of the Rappahannock River and she was a backwoods, barefoot Indian girl. <laughs> when I started to look into this piece called Sideshow Freaks and Circus Engines, she was the one who was telling me story and she gave me this character that I then extrapolated on during and right after the Civil War. What happened to our people, if there was any resistance, anyone who refused to conform, mm -hmm. they would be taken to this place in South Dakota called the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians. Real place. And this character, Izzy, refused to come out of the backwoods. She was hogtied and taken across the land on a train and put in the Hiawatha Asylum where she learned to become invisible. Izzy escapes and she ends up on a train headed for the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. And there was a train coming from the other direction, true story, this is a historical event, and the trains collided. So out of that wreckage crawled Izzy and a little girl calls herself Panther Girl. They hook up and decide to go to the World's Fair to make a killing. And Izzy's act she bills herself as Izzy the Invisible Woman, and she mixes up potions and disappears herself. The tension of how we are invisible on this land unless we take on the accoutrements of the colonizing narrative. It was really a turning point around those world's fairs and expositions where the narrative that we're still reacting to was honed and uh, solidified because all of those fairs and expositions, the purpose of them was to heighten and highlight the achievements of progress of 
civilization, which is, of course, white civilization, against savagery. Mm -hmm. So Geronimo was there. Yeah. Geronimo was brought there as a prisoner of war. He was brought in shackles to those exhibitions formed the container that I think that we're still rattling the cage trying to get out of. So that's why I started to look into my family's history being exhibited in sideshows, circus, dancing for tourists, because my mom was in the sideshow as a little girl, and she carried a lot of scars and shame from that. I wanted to look at what's in my body. What am I carrying from my mother having been on display? And how do I get that out? So this is much deeper for you than just just acting. This is this is a family tradition. Would you call well, it? Well, I'm generation three, three of four generations of performers in my family. I wouldn't say that we have a tra family tradition in, in the sideshow, but no. we have a family tradition of of performance. In my mother's generation with Spider-Woman, they transformed that exhibition performance into resistance and took it from survival into resilience and uh, reclamation, mm -hmm. you know, into that territory. Rematriation. Rematriation. Mm -hmm. That's a good word for it, yeah. That's my family tradition. Hi, my name is Jose Bernier. I am 21 years old, originally from OJ Bugamu. It took me a long while to kind of reclaim my identity and figure out what that even means to me. I spent half of my life growing up in the States and the other half in Canada. There was that weird pull of feeling like I don't belong in either. I felt I was too white to live in my community, but then I felt too brown to live in like anywhere else that wasn't my community really. And there was a lot of feeling misplaced and like I didn't really know who I was. I think the first steps to reclaiming my identity and who I am and where I come from was just opening myself up to explore that and be honest about it and unafraid about it. So I got to learn that for myself personally and you know, within myself, within my family, within my community, within my friends learning not only about different identities, it really allowed me to learn about myself and what being indigenous today means to me and respecting that, honoring that. I have so much pride in who I am and I would definitely encourage that in anyone who feels that they're not really sure where they belong. You belong here, you belong everywhere. You are meant to be here as who you are and even if that's not figured out yet, definitely reclaiming who you are where you come from, your culture, your language, traditions, everything that makes you who you are and letting that define you. You can initiate that for yourself and I think that's the most powerful way to do it and definitely the greatest thing you can do for yourself. Right, so we are now going to a hoop dancing workshop with Beanie John. Yep. How does a hula hoop work into a traditional dance? First so, of all, Chris, I mean, really. wait, wait, wait. You have to go way They're back. They're not hula hoops? If you say hula hoop in front of Beanie John, she yeah. will freak out at you. Oh, okay. It's not a hula yeah. hoop. It's a sacred hoop. And that circle, that idea of the circle comes up over and over again for indigenous people. So that right. represents that sacred way of life. But every time I've seen hoop dancing, it's just like a whole bunch of hoops spinning. The hoop dance has become known in the palace circuit as like the trick dance. But every single shape that's made in the hoop dance tells a story. So they're not just, you know, shapes for the point of making cool shapes. It's not a circus show, it's, it's storytelling. Chris? Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, Chris. 
Good to meet you. <laughs> I just want to take this time to introduce myself. Danse Tawau, Niana Nasuga Sun Bini John, Nia Nehio Pohe Kihuan, Alberta. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Bini John. I'm Plains Cree and Taino from Kihuan, Alberta. So, hoop dancing. One of the four elder brothers named Pakwis was a storyteller, a singer. And when Pakwis passed away, when he died, one of his other elder brothers, Nano Bojo, decided to take up a dance, a storytelling dance. A dance that combined everything together, just like how Pukwis did. When Nano Bojo took up that dance, he made different symbols and different pictures out of the hoops and manipulating them on his body and weaving them and interweaving them. So we're actually going to get to do that today. Good. And down. And your last direction. And up. Awesome. Good. And then pull. I. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry, did you guys enjoy the class? Oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, you were saying you taught yourself? Oh, yes. So basically, uh, 91 was the year I was born. Uh, and that's also the year that my parents started up their theater company, which is called Kiwa Native Dance Theater. When I would be really little, I'd play with all the extra hoops. You've seen in the class when there was extra hoops over there. Yeah. So all those extra hoops were my teaching tools. That's how I really learned to do this dance. And I would listen to their stories and how they would conduct their workshops. Also by staying traditional to the moves and adding your own flavor into it. That's kind of what I, what I do as well. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that part when you said, you know, what do you see? I saw a bow and yeah. somebody else saw something else and then we actually transitioned into a butterfly and That's, soared like an eagle. It was, I could feel that. The transformations that happen in hoop dancing are so magical, especially the part where you guys turn into the eagle and you're that wonderment. See, that's what I really live for, for uh, hoop dancing and also teaching. So much of the work that's going on is about reclamation and rematriation and how are you doing that in your work? Our people at one point were not allowed to do these styles. Even wearing our traditional galia, we weren't allowed to even wear those type of things. So I really took up this dance because of that, because of all the people that suffered just so that we have these hoops today. This dance is my really powerful dance and it goes back hundreds of years. And because of those people that gave up their life and went into hiding so that us women today could do this dance, that's, that's why I, no matter where I go, I always have my hoops. <laughs> 
We're at Exhibition Place in Toronto. And I want to acknowledge all the people that have walked through these gates from our culture and been sideshows, have been circus freaks, have been on, on display and as a spectacle. So I want to speak to the fact that we are not a spectacle. We are a living, vibrant, breathing culture that's not dead. And we're treated so much like that, it needs to be changed. We need to repair that. And I want to make the intention to these ancestors that walked before us that we're going to try and change that paradigm. This should never happen to our culture again. Also, we need to acknowledge that we do have relatives who uh, very much appreciate the powwow trail, who have grown up on the powwow trail, who have used the powwow trail as a way of reclaiming their culture and still accessing their culture. And I have a complicated relationship with powwows, but what I want to acknowledge is that the powwows today speak to the vibrancy of our culture. And as long as we know the truth, as long as we know our real history, then we can change and own our own destinies in the future. For all the walk before us and walk through the gates behind us. Miigwech. Miigwech. One moccasin track at a time. <laughs>